right. Thank you, everybody. I, I just want to say, I'm, as Kim said, Liz Alderman. I'm the uh, chief business correspondent for the New York Times here in Europe. And I have to say, I, every year that I come here, I love watching those student videos because I feel like they really capture the kind of global complexity um, of the issues that we're talking about here at the Democracy Forum. And climate change is certainly, uh, in my mind, and obviously in all of yours, one of the most uh, difficult and challenging issues that is facing our democracies uh, these days. Um, and I, so I'm thrilled to be here with an expert panel who can actually talk to many of the points that we just heard uh, made uh, on, the, on these videos. Um, and I mean, just to sort of set the backdrop here, you know, we know that global warming and the failure to tackle it in adequate and inclusive ways does have profound implications for democracy. Um, the good news, depending on <laughs> which side of the table you're sitting on, is that investments in climate tech have been booming um, in the last several years um, with uh, significant uh, results. Um, the downside is that, as we uh, heard uh, in one of the statements in one of the videos, um, that there is uh, a danger of a feeling that it could just be merely greenwashing um, or, or that it sets us, it can set people back uh, in terms of uh, enabling uh, human beings to continue uh, their destructive behaviors. And clearly, uh, the message is also that we don't have strong enough policies to deal with all of this. So, so with that, let me uh, welcome uh, you know, our distinguished panelists. You can see uh, their bios up on the screen here. But let me start with you, Azim. I mean, mm -hmm. this is really uh, your thing. Uh, you are an influential uh, thinker and, and speaker on this issue. Um, first of all, you know, just some numbers. Yeah. In the last several years alone, over $100 billion has been poured into climate tech investments. Yeah. Tell us what that looks like, um, kind of in the United States, in Europe, and globally, and why is that so important? What has that done for us so far? Yeah, of course. Thank you very much, uh, Liz. In some sense, it's, it's much more than $100 billion. Uh, two years ago, the total amount of investment <clears throat> that went into the energy system to clean and renewable technologies exceeded the investments that were going into fossil fuels. Uh, and in 2023, it was about $1.7 trillion into renewables, um, around a, tr a trillion dollars into fossil fuels. So we've passed that, that crossover point. And that brings with it some other good news. Uh, uh, analysts, uh, energy analysts and renewables analysts reckon that we have probably reached the point of peak carbon emissions uh, as a species on this, this planet this year or perhaps last year, and certainly at the, the point of peak oil demand. So all of this is, is quite good news. The emphasis is very, very much on the energy technologies, but of course the climate crisis is much broader than carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, there's the issues of biodiversity, uh, of, of nature, of, of water, uh, but it really all starts with tackling the carbon problem. And the reason is very simple. It's that carbon we emit through our use of energy. Energy is the driver of uh, health, wealth, and prosperity around the world. If you look at the strongest democracies in the world, if you look at the countries with the highest standards of living, they all consume lots of energy. And you can't really break that link. What we have been able to do with renewable technologies is break the link between carbon emissions and the energy that is provided. We're just getting started. It's growing very quickly. So one last data point. Um, in 2015, uh, about 1.5% of the world's electricity was produced renewably. Last year, it was nearly 6%. And renewable installations of electricity are growing at about 30% per annum. So we are in uh, what I would call that exponential growth phase uh, of the technology and its deployment. Mm -hmm. Beata, you as the, as the chief economist for the, for the EBRD, what are you seeing as the uh, effects of, of what Azim has just talked about? And also, what are you seeing as, I guess, the risks of leaning too much on the idea that climate tech can drive us forward as a be-all, end-all solution to this problem? Well, so everything depends what kind of climate tech we are talking about. If we are talking about better, cheaper ways of producing renewables, uh, that's absolutely what we need. If we talk about climate tech as in better storage, that's absolutely what we need. When we get into geoengineering, that becomes a dangerous territory because we don't want um, 
populist politician to say there is no need for carbon taxes, there is no need for hard work, we will just rely on geoengineering and that's going to solve all the problems. Um, but if I may come back to some of the issues Azim mentioned. Um, solar panels are very cheap. Um, famously in Germany they are cheaper for households than, than wooden fences uh, they install. <laughs> And yet, in Europe, we have this enormous unease about subsidized green products from China. Um, there is a desire in Europe, voiced by the European Parliament, to bring back the solar panel value chains. There are discussions about introduction of tariffs on green products from China. And yet, the Draghi report, um, has clearly stated that Europe has no competitive advantage in producing solar panels. Uh, raw materials are expensive, we have higher ex energy costs, we have higher labor costs. And it's not a sector, according to the report, where it matters very much who owns the technology. It's also uh, not type of production that creates lots of jobs. Actually, there are more jobs in installation than mm -hmm. in manufacturing. So how do you resolve that tension between the desire to have production at home and the, the need for speeding up climate change? I think that Formula One provides a great illustration how to deal with it. So imagine um, you are part of a Formula One team and your driver is in the lead. Uh, he is all about to win the race, but his tires are smoking. Right? Do you bring the car to the pit and in this way you forego winning the race? Or do you let him win the race risking um, a disaster? And the way you resolve it is by having a priori a hierarchy of objective. If a priori you decide safety first, safety is the most important thing, then you, know, you make the decision in seconds. We bring the guy to the pit. And I think that's what we need in Europe. We need a hierarchy of objectives so that uh, we can coordinate various policies. And the primary objective should be the speed of green transition. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I want to come back to, to the issue of, of policies, policy making in a non-boring way in just a few moments. But that leads me to Ivan. Um, Ivan, you have a very interesting job. You are in Estonia, basically in charge of ensuring um, that a just transition happens, a just climate transition happens. Tell us what that means exactly. What is your job like? And how does it relate to the challenges that you're dealing with relate to what uh, uh, we just heard our other panelists talking about. Um, thank you, Liz. Um, it's an honor to be here. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so yeah, what, what I do is I, I coordinate the Just Transition Fund, which is essentially a European Union's cohesion fund uh, aimed at specific regions. So the logic behind it is that, OK, so we have these uh, higher objectives that uh, you uh, Beata just talked about. And the higher objective is reaching climate neutrality by 2050. Well, it's a great objective, but some regions, some people will suffer more than others in reaching this objective, right? So there are certain regions throughout the European Union, actually throughout the world, that depend highly on, on fossil fuels. So essentially, what, in, in practical terms, what reaching climate neutrality means for them is losing their jobs, really. That's, that's, the, that's the most basic <laughs> understanding. So, so what my job is, so there is, there is this fund that is aimed specifically for regions like this to alleviate the socioeconomic um, tensions and, and, and challenges that they face in this transition. So it's okay, we have common targets, but we also have this fund set aside for regions that we know will hurt more than others and then um, allow them to sort of catch up with everything. So, so that's, that's what I do. But it obviously involves, uh, on the one hand, it's, it's money, right? It's a fund. On the other hand, it, it um, involves a lot of <laughs> coordination and sort of selling of the transition as such. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to help, we're trying to make people who depend on fossil fuels for their livelihoods. And we have probably done that for generations and they have you know, my grandfather, father, and myself are all working in this sector, let's say, uh, to give that up for something that is still somewhat unclear. Why should we do this in the first place? So, so this transition as well, the, the emotional transition, the 
um, the transition of identity is also something that we have to deal with here. Mm -hmm. Azim, you, both of you had a thought about that. Azim, why don't you go first and then Beata, your reaction. Of course. I, I, it's great to hear from uh, Ivan and the story of Idaviru region in, in Estonia because it reminds us this is much wider than, you know, uh, Western Europe or the United Kingdom or the United States. Um, I think we should also you know, recognize in, in the context of the D Democracy Forum that um, being able to participate as a citizen is closely connected to your ability to get energy and predominantly in the form of, of electricity. And so outside of the richer countries in, in the world, the climate technologies is, are really, really starting to, to deliver because they are so cheap. And we all know that it's cheapest uh, way of getting um, electricity is through solar panels. So you look at efforts like um, Sun Culture or Acumen uh, who allow people, enable people commercially through, throughout the Global South to get their first kilowatts of electricity to run lights and fridges. That is a dynamic where way. Is this hap where uh, was through, this specific uh, Throughout example that um, uh, Africa, so Kenya, yeah. Tanzania, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and uh, n a number of the other uh, countries there. Uh, but, but another great example is in, is in Pakistan. So Pakistan is not a byword for great institutional robustness and uh, functioning polity. Um, and as the electrical grid has come under deep, deep strain over the last year, years, individual homeowners and individual businesses have been buying solar panels like crazy and have been able to power their lives and therefore participate in the economy in a way that bypassed the dysfunction of the institutional arrangements within that country. So one of the reasons I'm really excited about climate tech uh, is in the context of democracy is that in being able to provide people with energy and electricity, you are able, you are enabling them to function as economic agents, but also as, as citizens. Uh, and, and what I love about the challenge that Ivan raises is that's all good and well, but what about the people running oil shale power stations in mm -hmm. Idaviru, in Estonia, and, and elsewhere? But I want to just rem remind us that we are actually allowing people to participate in the most fundamental ways in the economy by making it cheap and affordable to access the electricity that allows them to become citizens and, and economic entities. That's a good point, but Beata, is that, what do you think? Is that, is that too optimistic? <laughs> well, I believe that Ivan's job is incredibly important because if we are serious about climate change, uh, we are going to need big structural changes in our economies in, in advanced countries. Um, and we are going to need massive investment and somebody will need to pay for it. Actually, at the EBRD, we did household surveys in 37 countries. We interviewed more than 1,000 1, households in each country, a representative um, sample. And what we found is that when you ask people, is climate change real? Are today's children going to be substantially affected by climate change? Um, three quarters of people say yes. It, it is real, it is happening. Only actually a quarter of people are skeptical. But when you pose the question as, a, as an economic trade-off, should government prioritize uh, climate or environment over jobs, enthusiasm evaporates. And actually in Estonia, only 43% of people say yes, environment is more important than jobs. If you ask people, are you willing to pay more taxes so that the government can address climate change, less than a fifth of people in Estonia say yes. And actually, yeah. the numbers for Germany are quite similar, for Eastern European countries are quite similar. So if you split people into three groups, the skeptics, those who live in denial, the disengaged, those who believe that climate change is real but they are unwilling to pay, and the supporters, right, those who want to do something, are willing to pay, you see that the skeptics and the disengaged account in many cases for more than half of the electorate. Mm -hmm. right? So they have the power um, to influence the political process. And then when you look at who are the disengaged, well, these are people without university education, so for them, 
retraining, changing profession will be harder. And these are people typically in the lower half of the income distribution. So these are people who don't have the savings cushion to carry them through the adjustment period. Yeah, I think, um, thank you for making that, that last point too, because there are people who are, you know, willing to pay for the change uh, and are not willing, but there are also plenty of people who are not able to pay for the change. And when we talk about, you know, this, Ivan, you were, had your hand raised to, to respond to a point that, you know, uh, Azim had made. What, uh, how, tell us about the, the inequality aspect of this. Well, there are, there, there are a few things that I, yeah, wanted to comment on. First of all, um, I do, I'm also a believer in distributed networks, and I think it's a great, it's a great thing, but we should all understand that it doesn't give the governments a free pass not to think strategically about the infrastructure that they must build. So in that sense, yeah, it's, it, it, <laughs> it cannot be done so that, oh yeah, it, it's gonna figure itself out because the solar panels are so cheap. So, well, if, if we have, for example, some sort of a supply chain, you know, glitch or something, then what do we do? On the other hand, as I think is the case with, for example, mobile internet, in, in case of, let's say, African states as well, there was a lot of talk um, 10, 15 years ago that they were able to bypass the physical grid of the internet and go straight to mobile. Well, now it poses its own questions with accessing, for example, or, or exchanging massive amounts of data, which is important for AI. So yes, you, you won at some point, but now maybe not so much. The, 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 the robust networks that sort of stitch our societies together, they're still important. So I think uh, capacity building and, and institutions are still, they still have a massive role to play in this transition anyway. Uh, on the other hand, um, what we've heard, for example, with the, with the youth, right? So, uh, or even the, what you just mentioned, um, I think it's still important to understand that it's, it should be business still. So it's not all public support, public money, because public money comes from where? Taxes. Mm -hmm. Who generates taxes? Business. So in that sense, we can't really do this just by, you know, um, well, we have no choice maybe with the huge expenditures that we have to make up front with uh, sort of loaning it from all over the place. But still, we need to understand that we cannot do this on public sector's money alone. There needs to be a lot of private investment. Mm -hmm. Um, and how do we support that? How do we build policies and institutions yeah. which investors trust mm -hmm. to invest in particular localities and then help those people transition? That is a super important aspect. Yeah, yeah so Azim, tell us, tell us where in the world this has been successful in your view. Give us some, give us some examples. Uh, well, we're, we're very early on uh, in all of this. It's only been in the last six or seven years that we could reliably say uh, it's cheaper to build uh, through renewables and through, through fossil fuels. And it, it, it has this complex uh, characteristic in the sense that it's more expensive to buy, but it's cheaper to operate over a long period of time. And for most businesses and households, it's, it's often that first payment that matters most. <laughs> and so that's one of the big barriers to people moving, say, towards heat pumps for their heating rather than a traditional boiler, you know, the heat pump costs three times as much initially, but over 10 years is far, far cheaper than running a boiler. So that is where, and I say that, Liz, just to say we haven't had a lot of time to see the changes happen. But I'll give a great example, which is in, um, uh, in South Africa. So in South Africa, uh, as you may imagine, as an, an emerging economy, the grid is very strained. There were lots of blackouts and brownouts of power but there are lots of solar and wind resources, particularly around uh, the, the Cape. And ESCOM, which was the, uh, the power company, fought very, very hard to prevent individual businesses investing in wind turbines and solar panels uh, because they, didn't, they, didn't, they wanted to have a national availability and control of the over, overall grid. And that, fight, that fighting went all the way into courts until finally regulations changed to allow the participation of other businesses in the wider provision of electricity in South Africa. Now, what it doesn't do is it doesn't eliminate the, the need that both Beata and, and, and Ivan will talk about of, of government coordination and policy coordination. But what we need to do is change those mechanisms so that many, many other people can participate in this energy system. And that word participate, participate is really important because it's not just an economic term. It is actually, it, it is a term that 
connects us to participating in our society. I mean, I see it as a cousin term to the ideas of democracy with, within it. So, yeah, I mean, and that actually goes back to a point that was raised in one of the, the video statements, this concern about corporate capture. Right. Um, when we're talking about po the need for more coordinated policy making, the risk is always that regulators wind up getting captured by the biggest players to the disadvantage of others. Well, that, sorry, pardon me, that's what's happened yeah. in California. Mm -hmm. So in California, in the last uh, year or two, uh, there's been a regulatory change uh, pushed by the big utilities, supported by the governor, that has made it much more expensive for homeowners to, to run solar panels. And, and, and the reasoning, you can read behind the lines, is ultimately we don't want to lose our market share. Yeah. Beata, how do you address that as a policymaker? Yeah, so <laughs> regulatory fr frameworks are absolutely important. Um, so at the EBRD, um, last year, more than 50% of our investment was uh, in green transition. So that's more than 6 billion euros. But perhaps more important part of our job mm -hmm. is helping governments um, improve or create regulatory framework that allows the possibility of um, growth of renewable sector. You know, you, we help them um, conduct auctions, we help them think about how to deal with feed-in tariffs, and in this way, we unlock opportunities, not just for ourselves to invest, but also for private sector. So in a sense, what we need is government strategy, regulatory framework, we need public investment, and we need to mobilize private investment exactly as, as Ivan said. Mm -hmm. let, me ask, let me ask you all um, a question that also is an issue that, that came up in, in the video, and that is the question of, this all sounds, on the one hand, great, the acceleration of, of, these, of many different technologies, um, you know, wind, solar, you know, but then there are other technologies that have been subject to a great deal of concern and criticism, such as, as carbon capture. And, you know, going forward, uh, or even if you take, you know, electric, uh, electric batteries for EVs, you know, there's been a lot of reporting that, you know, our newspaper and others have done um, about uh, the environmental damage that is done uh, by harvesting minerals to make these green technologies. So, Talk to us a little, can you address the, 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 the concern about the greenwashing aspect of climate tech? Because it's very clear that we do need technology to help power the way forward. Um, there doesn't seem to be any other real solution to accelerating the uh, addressing climate change. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, sometimes we're finding out that there's you know, a dark side to these yeah. technologies. So can you talk about mm -hmm. that a little bit? I mean, th these technologies are, are remarkable, but they're not magic, um, and they do require things to be pulled out of the ground. The, but the materiality of these uh, climate technologies, from batteries through to solar panels, it is a matter of scientific fact. It's a sort of empirically testable. Uh, and in a recent paper in, in Nature, uh, the, the, the data show that the material impact of a, a full decarbonization of our energy system is substantially lower than the material impact of municipal waste and substantially lower than fossil fuels. And by, by substantial, I, for, I forget the, the number, but it's more than one order of magnitude. It may be approaching two. So the, the footprint is, is far lower than it otherwise would be. It, it's also going to be much cheaper. So colleagues uh, are of, uh, of, of Beata's at Oxford University um, in my, her many hats, she's a professor there uh, as well, but at the Oxford Martin School last year, uh, came out with a report which showed that a, clim carbon, a climate transition of the energy system by 2050 would have a net economic effect of $12 trillion. So it's not that it would be more expensive, it's that it would be $12 trillion cheaper than a slow transition uh, with, with fossil fuels, which is roughly 0.5% of GDP. So what, we are, what we're dealing with is um, something that will have significant economic benefits on top of the climate benefits and has much lower material demands. However, and here's the however, of course there are going to be communities that are affected. And within, uh, within Chile, where the lithium uh, is harvested through those, those flats, 
Uh, there are absolutely communities that are under deep, deep stress and strain by the scale with which that um, industry is, is growing. And that's where this becomes a question of uh, participatory democracy, of listening and hearing from those communities and figuring out what kind of settlement uh, is, is needed. I don't mean an economic settlement. I, do, I mean a, you know, an agreement, a, 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 an accommodation. Um, that part, uh, Liz, is, is well above my pay grade, so I would turn to somebody <laughs> else who <Well>, can <laughs> address those questions. Go ahead, yeah. If, if I may make a link to critical raw materials, that, yeah. uh, as you mentioned, lithium, uh, as you probably all know, um, green transition requires huge inputs of, of minerals. For instance, production of an uh, electric vehicle requires a lot of graphite. Mm -hmm. um, wind turbines, offshore wind turbines, uh, require rare earth, right? Um, now, two-thirds of global production of graphite and rare earth takes place in China. Yeah. Now, graphite was in the news last year because of export restrictions that were introduced by China in response to the U.S. Chips Act that limits technology flows uh, to China. Um, there were other restrictions on gallium and germanium, of which China produces more than 90%. Now, why is China producing so much of that? Well, you know, it was convenient for us to have somebody else uh, mine and process some of these elements. Some of them come with very unpleasant environmental uh, effects, side effects. So, for instance, rare earths are often found with radioactive substances. So they are very polluting. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we are now find ourselves in a situation where escalation of tensions with China could cut us off from critical raw materials because an export restriction can be introduced at the stroke of a pen, but developing a new mine takes more than a decade. Mm -hmm. Right. And I mean, that is one of the risks that many people are, are talking about, actually, as trade tensions between the United States uh, and China ramp up and inevitably with you know, Europe. Obviously, the looming United States election will have a very big impact on this. Um, mm -hmm. And you will find parts of the world that may find themselves suddenly caught short. Um, as you said, China's the biggest producer now of many of the green uh, technology you know, equipment. Um, in the example that you cited earlier from, from Germany, a colleague of, of mine at the New York Times wrote this cool story about how Germans were tackling climate change on their own by basically putting solar panels on their balconies. Mm -hmm. The way that they were able to do this is because they had become incredibly cheap because they were all made in China. And even though Germany is a fairly protectionist country, people didn't care. What they cared about was that they could afford it, it helped them lower their energy bills. But once you become dependent um, on a country like China and a kind of a global trade war breaks out, you're, you're then caught in this sort of catch-22. And that's the risk that policymakers like yourself are mm -hmm. trying, to, trying to face off, mm -hmm. to head off. Ivan, you uh, have a perspective on that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's so much content, I think. Um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> as far as going back to the question of, of, of technologies, um, I don't know, at least in, Est in Estonia, and I think maybe this is a good approach, is to stay technology agnostic, so we explore all options. Because we know that whenever there is an easy solution, then everybody tends to flock there and think that this is gonna be, you know, it's gonna solve everything. But the reality is the climate crisis is so complex and, yeah. and, uh, and all medicines tend to have side effects. So in that sense, we, 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 should, we, we should be really, how to say, we should be exploring all the options because really exploring all the options is the only option that we have. Uh, we cannot go for some, or, or believing in like this really quick fixes, I just don't know, I, I, I don't think, on a personal level, and haven't really seen any quick fixes in such complex problems uh, actually delivering results in the long term. So I think CO2 capture should be explored, uh, you know, all the different aspects should be explored. It's just in the end, again, we come back to institutions and policies as to what is the wisest and the politically acceptable options uh, to, to solve the issues that we have. Mm. The transition is a political process. It's a political yeah. process in choosing, in the end, choosing the solutions, but also making sure that what I deal with, uh, making sure that the people who are sort of uh, in the crosshairs of this transition are not left behind. Mm -hmm. 
because in the end, what they do, if they are not convinced, if we don't talk to the, if we don't talk, if we don't explain, if we don't get as my, as I mean, there is never, um, as we all know, it's a bell curve, right? Sometimes you, there are 20 or 15 percent of people you will never get on the same page with yourself. Uh, there are early adopters. There is this just bulk of people who will come when they see that their friends are also sort of, you know, joining the gig. But but there is a certain portion of people which will never be on your side, and that's okay. Uh, but we still need to make an effort to make sure that we bring people along because the problem, and that sort of brings us to the name of this conference, is they protest via the ballot box in the end. If they're and we've not been convinced, seeing that more and yeah, more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if they're not more. convinced, yeah. then they're going to let you know. It might take right. a little while. You might think that everybody is super happy about the green transition, but then at some point you realize that maybe not. So in that sense, there needs to be effort, and it's a, in a sense, it's a little bit of a messy effort. It, you need to go to the communities, you need to talk to them, you need to go to that mine and put on that hat, and not just for a few selfies, but actually understanding the toil and the pride that comes with, you know, with that toil in those communities. And you need to sort of make sure that you address the human aspect of this whole thing. And, uh, and probably that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. that's what I wanted to say. I, you know, I, th I think this is such an important point, and, and I, I would say that there are hints in certain places that the way we talk about this has, has changed. Uh, so two days ago, the last coal-fired power station in the United Kingdom, Radcliffe on Stour, was shut down. We were the first sort of nation to use coal as an energy system, and we've, we now have none of it after 180-odd years. Um, and five years ago, the dialogue... In, 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 the, in the space was that coal was dirty, coal has got us into, these, into this mess. And with Radcliffe on Stour closing, the, the dialogue had changed. It was, we've come to the end of an era. Coal has been an incredible contributor to human well-being around the world. We recognize the efforts of the people mm -hmm. who brought this together. We recognize the communities, which the British state had, had not in the 1980s recognized the, the coal communities. And, and there was something in the shift in the tone that I noticed um, over how we might have discussed this five or six years ago. And perhaps it's, it's the idea of the just transition. It's people like Ivan and his, his colleagues over the last work over the last decade that has us, us looking at these things in uh, more human terms and terms that sort of reflect what we knew and understood and benefited from at the time. Yeah. Let me just, I think that's a very important point. I did want to remind the audience that we will be opening it up to questions in about one or two minutes. So get your questions ready, put your hands up um, so that we can bring a microphone to you. But Beata, let me, let me give you a chance to respond to that. If, if I may just echo what, what has been said. I think we haven't been very good at explaining the green transition to people because we talk about this green future with lots of green jobs. And yes, there will be lots of green jobs. But between the green future and today, there is a transition period. Mm -hmm. And we sort of failed to mention the transition period, mention the coal mines that will have to close, um, mention that there, will, there are many polluting firms in your part, and actually my part of the world, in the Eastern European EU member states. Actually, at the EBRD, we did an analysis looking at which lo local labor markets will be affected. And, Lots of them, right? So we, have it, we failed to reassure people that we will take care of them uh, during the transition period. You know, we need more Ivans. Oh, Jesus, um, thank one, you, one of course. Last point, but yeah, just one quick remark on. as far as uh, putting this into perspective. Uh, like with, with my work in Idaviru in, in Estonia, uh, which is an exciting region to start with, you should take a look at the map and you'll understand what I mean. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so... Part of NATO, part of the EU, all good. Uh, but anyways, 80% of the people speak Russian language, uh, which is not a language of the EU, which, under, which means that they don't really understand the green agenda that we have. Yes, the EU speaks in all the languages of the EU, but it, not in the language that this commun specific community understands. But anyway, what I wasn't, wanted to actually uh, sort of address was it's great to have a, a good plan for a green future and everything, but the oil shell worker comes to me and says, Great, the, um, you're investing into uh, factories, let's say. They're going to be done in two, uh, or ready in two years. I lost my job yesterday. Yeah. Well, what, what's the benefit of the factory for me if I'm losing my job today? So we need to make sure that it's, a trans it's not a jump. 
It's a transition. It is going to be painful. We need to carry those people through. We need to carry those communities through. What the instruments are, I mean, it's up to each government really to, un to, to decide whether it's early retirement or it's uh, some sort of or holding the older, something that obviously the, um, let's say, the, the people uh, who are more poor environments will not understand, but holding the polluting industries for a couple of years longer so that then the transition can be easier. So things like this, these trade-offs, they need to be made. Uh, but again, they need to be explained and understood. Right. It's an uncomfortable truth. Yep. Please raise your hand if you have a question. If I can call. Many. Uh -huh. My goodness. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes, this lady in the front. Please ask, please keep your questions to the point. Um, we don't have time for statements, so just please ask your question to the panelists. Thank you. Well, my question, hello, my name is Valentina, Hi. and my question does need a little bit of context. So I'm Ecuadorian, and in Ecuador, we literally democratized this topic. We took, it, we took it to the ballot if we want to continue with resource extraction in the Amazon forest since we host the Yasuni National Park that is the most, one of the most biodiverse places of Earth. Mm -hmm. um, and we chose to stop oil extraction there, yet we are scared that it might be detrimental to our economy. Mm. At the same time, we're experiencing the effects of climate change since we're living the worst drought of the last 71 years. And as you said, uh, electricity drives economic development, and we depend on hydroelectric power, so we have no electricity right now. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So my question is the following. What do you propose to countries like mine, where we might not be economic power, mm. but we're vital for our planet's health? Yeah, that's great. We didn't even <laughs> get to discuss the Global South yet, but who would like to take that? Yeah. Technology, investment. I, I think we need a way of yeah. valuing biodiversity and, and sort of incorporating it in decisions and you know, finding a revenue stream that would support biodiversity in places like Amazon forest. Mm -hmm. But you know, the truth is it's not easy. We are beginning to think about this now. Yeah, and I, I'll add to that. Um, you know, valuing nature, a carbon price, these are all really important uh, objectives, but they're politically very, very difficult to, to achieve. We should try to achieve them. In the meantime, uh, what the technology allow, uh, enables is it creates a little bit of space. Um, and so, of course, the challenge with the drought, which is affecting Ecuador, is also affecting Zambia at the moment with the Kariba Dam uh, problems. Uh, you, you, you have the cost of having energy resilience is much cheaper now than it was 20 years ago with solar panels having dropped 99% in, in price. Um, and so, so if you are a hydro-rich uh, nation like Ecuador, like Costa Rica as well, um, and you are at risk to, to climatic changes like this, the cost of building some resilience has dropped significantly. And distributed resilience is, is a little bit cheaper now as well, which means that even if the state is not able to, perhaps with the help of aid, um, businesses may start to, to, to chip in. Let, let's, let's go to another question. But I, just to your point, I think it's a very interesting point that you make. And oftentimes, the discussion is obviously sort of framed by the West. And I think it could be a whole other panel, basically, to talk about <laughs> the Global South and the voice that the Global South has or doesn't have in this as a result of these. Yes, a uh, brief question, because so I'd like to get to at least two to three more questions. Hi, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you just said that this could be a whole other panel, but I think that actually it's a really important part of this conversation that we're having right now. So I want to push you a little bit more on that Global South involvement. What is the responsibility or obligation of industrialized countries to help these less industrialized countries develop with green technology? Because the fact of the matter is there are a handful of the most industrialized countries on this globe who have contributed the most to climate change. And they should be the ones who are helping make sure that that doesn't happen in the future while not hindering the economic development of these other non-industrialized countries. So what, is the, what are those countries' responsibilities and obligations? That's a really important point. And it's, it's also that is also the subject of major political debate <laughs> right now, yeah. especially in the US election. Ivan, do you want to take it? Uh, yeah, maybe I should comment on this, but I'll do it more as a private person, so you can take that 
just transition process coordinator out. But, um, but what I think is, uh, on the one hand, we know that through, oh my God, through the UNFCCC, we have the mechanism, right, for developed countries supporting developing countries. There are contributions, there are, there are pledges to be made. I understand that at next COP, this is actually something that's going to be under discussion quite heavily as to how do we up the game as far as contributing the, the developed nations contributing to the development of, of the developing nations. But the, one of the aspects which I think is really interesting here is that one of the reasons why this is not going as fast as it should be is uh, the institutions, which are not really that strong. So you can give the money and it can be spent on, on all sorts of great things, but not necessarily the things you give them for. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, there is, uh, there is uh, this aspect, which is again, we come back to the, to the, to the democratic processes, to, to the trust between governments, to the political processes. Okay, we can support, but we can support things which we know that are going to help you, not those other things that would be nice to do. So in that sense, there is this kind of, it's, it's a two-sided coin, uh, if you know what I mean. Like, on the one hand, there is certain support. Yes, it's not enough. On the other hand, uh, money didn't, you know, end in the world. We still have it, but, but, but it's not necessarily a wise idea to give it to purposes which you cannot control, which you do not have KPI attached to, or which, yeah. which you don't really... Uh, trust that will be used wisely. Um, so in that sense, I think it, it is a political debate. It is an uncomfortable uh, subject, but yeah. I don't know. That's my personal take on it, at least from following the discussions. Okay. Let me, let me take, we're over on time, but I'm going to take liberty because we started our panel a little bit earlier. So I think we have time for two more questions. Yes, sir. Good day, and thank you for your positioning. I represent Cultural Infusion Foundation. My name is Mario, and based on what discussed to your panel, I realize that you are highlighting the sifting of cultural beliefs in peoples and populations when discussing climate change. So my question goes to you, Beata. Are we thinking that supporting economically the cultural identification of how these populations feel about this transition could be a part of the funding mechanism of reconstruction and development and not only discussing infrastructures or the actual profit, but rather engage into investment funding to realize the acculturation needed in place for them people to transition to the new beliefs. Thank you. I want to answer that briefly. Yes. So. I've, our, my institution has worked for 30 years on supporting reforms in post-communist countries. If, and if there is one thing we learned is that reforms never last unless they have a broad-based support. And how to get this broad-based support? It's a question people like you, people like Ivan, people like um, others in the audience should help answer. Okay, let's, I'm going to take one more question. Yes, sir. You, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, well, today on the panel of climate tech, we extensively talked about uh, developments or innovations being made in the energy sector. But the fact is that it only truthfully accounts for one third of the carbon emissions. So can we talk also about the innovations being made in other sectors that need to be scaled if the just green transition were to really take place? Yeah. Thank you. Azim, you want to yeah, I'm happy to do that. And thank you. You did the video, I think, yeah. uh, up there. So. Um, it all starts with energy. Um, if we want to uh, decarbonize the, the cement and concrete and steel, um, you're going to need to electrify those processes. So the, the starting point to all of this is bringing down the cost of electricity, which is what we're able to do through the energy technologies. And of course, we then have questions around, um, you know, what will we do with, with land use and, ag and, and agriculture, um, which are you know, in, in 10, 15 percent of, of, of emissions in, by some measures in, 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 in different ways. Um, but the starting point always has to be with the energy uh, technologies. The progress in the other technologies is, is, is very, very good. But in honesty, it's years away from being at the kind of scale that we can drive an energy transition in. And so in my mental model, it starts by a lot more electricity, zero carbon emissions, creating space for the industrial and agri agricultural transitions uh, that you've alluded to. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I'm afraid we'll have to wrap it up there. But thank you for a robust discussion and robust questions. Thank you.